When I was younger, and as a child, when I came into to this church, and maybe when I started taking a little bit more notice about what was going on, especially when I saw something like this that's at the front here today, this table with the mysterious cloth over it, what's underneath? Well, if you've been here before, or if you've been to a church that does something like this, and they cover the communion table, you will know that it is the communion table, that it is what we're here for today, and what we're going to talk about today. But as a child, I remember being a bit confused, sort of, what was it all about? Why were we coming to church and having this meal that everyone called a meal that you saw the tiniest portion <laughs> of bread. I mean, it wouldn't fill up a mouse. And the tiniest, tiniest little drink that you could imagine. What's the point in having a meal with such small portions? Is everyone on a diet? <laughs> Especially when you take into consideration the other kind of meals that we had as church lunches, and even today, church lunches, when you see the food, you see everyone's walking with plates and plates and plates of food. There's plenty for everyone to have. So why is this meal so different? What, what makes it stand out? What, what makes this uh, so significant? Why were people so satisfied receiving what seems to be so little? Well, this is communion, and it's also called the Lord's Supper. Called as much because the Lord Jesus gave it to us. And it's through him and through this that we're able to be in relationship with the he Heavenly Father. It's also sometimes called Eucharist, which comes from the Greek word meaning thanksgiving. Communion is brought up by Paul in 1 Corinthians 10 and 11, the latter of which we will be coming to in a little bit. And he brings it up as a, as a kind of a, a, a reminder. He's, he's instructing the Corinthian church on some of the things that they aren't quite getting right. But... When I was a child, I obviously wasn't, get, I wasn't taking communion then. I just saw it happening and was like, that seems very odd. I wonder what it's about. I was missing out on all of the context of why it was meaningful, why it meant so much when people came, and what was the point? Why did people want to be at the communion table? I wasn't really connecting or aware of what was being remembered, what was being observed in that moment. And it wasn't because I hadn't forgotten it. <coughs> but as a child, you're obviously quite eager to learn. You want to find out more. And so, as time goes on, you come to an understanding of what it's all about. And when you get to the point you can make the decision to follow Christ yourself, that is when the decision to come to the communion table is all the more important. It's now for me to watch out, just like it is for all of us, to watch out so that we don't forget or we don't neglect the importance and the significance of this communion table. But again, what made it so special? Well, the first time it happened, it was instituted by Jesus himself at the Passover feast, which he had with his disciples just before his death, before his betrayal, before he was beaten, mocked, and scorned. Now, Passover is a Jewish feast 
which commemorated the final plague on Egypt, which is found in Exodus chapter 12, when the Israelites were instructed by God through Moses to take a lamb without defect and kill it at the instructed time, which was at twilight on the 14th day of the first month, and used some of the blood from that lamb and put it over the doorway and on the sides of the door where the lambs were being eaten, making sure that that lamb was then, when it was eaten, was enough to cover the family in that household. The lambs were roasted with bitter herbs and eaten with unleavened bread. In verse 12 of Exodus, on the same night, I will pass through Egypt and strike down every firstborn of both people and animals, and I will bring judgment on all the gods of Egypt. I am the Lord. The blood will be a sign for you on the houses where you are, and when I see the blood, I will pass over you. No destructive plague will touch you when I strike Egypt. This command was given, and it also was to be repeated. Every year, God said through Moses to his people, do this every year. Remember this feast every year. And we can see a parallel to the lamb, to the blood in the Lord's Supper. In Luke 22, verse 17 to 20, he says, After taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among you. For I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. The Lamb here is Jesus, and he instructs his disciples to partake of the bread, which is representing his body, and drink of the wine, which is representing his blood. And that when they do this, to do it in remembrance of him. Because at this point, he's also saying, I'm going to die, and they have had clues. They have had plenty of clues to know that he is dying and that he is going to die for their sins. He's going to die for everyone's sins around them and he died for our sins too. Now, we all need a little bit of a reminder every now and again. That's why phones have got so many different apps that you can set to give you an alarm, to give you a message, to say to you, don't forget this, don't forget this, here's what you need to get when you go shopping, don't forget this, oh by the way, I'm an app that you haven't used in six months, I'm still here. And this, in the letter that Paul wrote to the Corinthians, is their reminder. He is saying to them, wake up, stop taking for granted the communion table. Stop doing the communion wrong. You think you're doing it right, but you're actually doing it wrong. He's trying to remind them and impress upon them the importance of taking the communion table seriously, of treating it with the seriousness that it deserves. In 1 Corinthians 11, 23 to 26, he says, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you, the Lord Jesus, on the same night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread 
and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. In these verses, he repeats those words that were spoken by Jesus at that first Lord's Supper, the accounts of which can be found in Luke 22, 17 to 20, which I read earlier, and also in Matthew 26, 26 to 30, and Mark 14, 22 to 26. John doesn't have an account of the actual words that were spoken. He has an account of the teachings that happened around the feast. That's why there is no John there. Paul is trying, really trying, really emphasizing, get the Lord's Supper right. He's pointing out in previous verses and in uh, um, later verses where the Corinthians are going wrong in their observance of communion. Because in earlier, earlier verses, he points out saying that they are not getting the Lord's Supper right, even though they think they are. They might, as many do, start with the best of intentions, but maybe with repetition over time, it's lost its meaning. And therefore, what it began as is no longer what it is. Maybe now they're coming towards it and they're just kind of blasé about it. It doesn't really matter. It doesn't really matter what happens at that table. It doesn't really matter what they're trying to remember. And so they're not taking it seriously. But they need to take it seriously. We need to take it seriously. The early church uh, often had meals together and at the same time they would have communion. People would bring their own food to such gatherings and try and observe the Lord's Supper. But it wasn't quite working out how it started out, as I said. And it wasn't quite working out how it should have, because some people were eating their fill and having loads and loads and loads of food, and others were left hungry. And that isn't really a communion, that isn't really walking together, that isn't a body being together, because the rich, the wealthy, the well-off in that church, in that gathering, were keeping the food that they brought for themselves, and they were having their fill. They were starting way before anyone else. Those that had little, or maybe turned up late, were left with nothing. That doesn't speak of a, a strong bond of family. That speaks of, I don't really care about you, I'm fine, so that's okay. Which isn't what Jesus taught them to do, to practice. Now, a lot of the time, like we're going to do today, we have communion as a separate ceremony, as something that is separated out from other mealtimes, like church lunches, when we have those. It's not to say that we can't have communion at those times, because we obviously can, but when we do it, whatever we do it, whenever we do it, we must treat it with the reverence that it deserves. In practicing these things, in what God has asked us to do, what Jesus has set forth for us to do in remembering his death and remembering his sacrifice, we must not let it become a ritualistic habit that is just done out of right, just done, we're at church, it's been a couple of weeks now, maybe we'll have communion. No, let us do it at the times that are, make it meaningful so we remember the importance and the significance of what we are remembering. We must not come to this table without first considering the state of ourselves. I don't mean what clothes you're wearing, I don't mean how nice your hair is, I don't mean whether you've got your socks pulled up properly or your lace is done. It's asking us to take a look at our hearts. It's asking us to take a look at what condition our heart is in. Is our heart in the condition that God would go, I'm happy with that. I'm pleased with your heart condition. Or would he say, no, you have something that you need to deal with in your heart. 
Because in 1 Corinthians 11, 27 to 32, Paul says this, So then, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink from the cup. For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ, eat and drink judgment on themselves. This is why many among you are weak and sick, and a number of you have fallen asleep. But if we are more discerning with regard to ourselves, we would not come under such judgment. Nevertheless, when we are judged in this way by the Lord, we are being disciplined so that we will not be finally condemned with the world. Paul points out our heart condition. Examine our hearts before we come to the communion table. Are we ready to receive communion? Are we ready to remember the sacrifice that God, the Son of God, Jesus, made for us? Are we ready to remember the fact that he gave up his life as an innocent man? No blame, no wrongdoing. But he was beaten, he was mocked, he was scorned. He carried his own cross and then was hung on that cross. He bled and he died because the wrong that was hung on him was mine, was yours. Are we in the condition to come and receive the body that was broken? Are we in the right place to come and receive blood? Because if we're not, we're only inviting consequences on ourselves. We're only inviting a telling off. We're only inviting a punishment. We're only inviting a reprimand. We're only inviting for God to come and deal with our sin himself, rather than us dealing with it. Because he wants us to recognize when we've done something wrong, when we've made a mistake. He wants us to recognize when something isn't right and come before him. He will always be the one that forgives us. We can't forgive our own sin. He is the only one who can forgive our sin. But he wants us to recognize that we're broken, that we need him. He wants us to recognize that our lives will be fulfilled if we come to him and say, Lord, I repent. So reflection is needed to realize, and then confession is needed, and repentance in the areas that we see that we are not walking as God wants us to walk. Jesus too encourages reflection and dealing with sin before coming to worship. In Matthew 5, 23 to 24, therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar, and there, remember that your brother or sister has something against you. Leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled to them, and then come and offer your gift. If we do not deal with the things that we need to deal with before coming to God, before worshipping him, before reflecting, before realizing, acknowledging, and then confessing and coming to repentance, we should not be surprised when God steps in and decides to discipline us. Paul makes mention of those who are sick or asleep in his letter to the Corinthians. And he says this, but if we were more discerning with regard to ourselves, we would not come under such judgment. If we reflected more, when we come to the communion table, about what needs to be dealt with in our lives, we would not have as many problems as we, as we have. If we were honest with God, we would not have as many problems as we have. 
That's what confession is. It's being honest with God. Whether you're honest directly with him or you're honest with a fellow brother and sister who is walking with God, bringing it before him in that way is dealing with it so that it is not repeated. Reflection, confession, and repentance. The time to do that is right now. You don't have to wait for a specific time. But when we have communion, it's a good reminder for us to all take stock and go, what is the condition of my heart? Because in Psalm 32, it says this. This is verse 1 to 5. Blessed is the one whose transgressions are forgiven whose sins are covered. Blessed is the one whose sin the Lord does not count against them, and in whose spirit is no deceit. When I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night, your, hands, your hand was heavy on me. My strength was sapped as in the heat of summer. Then I acknowledged my sin to you and did not cover up my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. Blessed is the one whose transgressions are forgiven. They are forgiven by confession. Not by us covering them up. Not by us saying, oh God, you didn't see that. Got away with that one. No, you didn't. God saw it. And he wants you to be honest with him. At the heart of communion is the bread and the wine, those symbols that help us remember what we are partaking in. We need the body and we need the blood. Jesus himself said that we need it. He didn't say that we need bread and wine. He said we need body and blood his body and his blood. In John 6, 53 to 58, Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise them up at the last day. For my flesh is real food, and my blood is real drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me, and I in them. Just as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so the one who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Your ancestors ate manna and died, but whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. So when we think about it, really, it's not about the small bit of bread that you get. It's not about the small bit of wine. It's about what they represent. It's about the act that Jesus undertook for our sin, which was his death. It was his broken body, the broken bread. It was the pouring out of his blood, which is in the wine. That is what we're here to remember. And that is what we're here to say thank you for. We're here to say thank you to the Son because He gave his life so that we could be in relationship with the Father, so that we could be reconciled to him. Last week we heard about covenants as well as the importance of blood. There's no blood more important than the blood of Jesus. And if you haven't caught the message that we heard last week, I do encourage you to go... Uh, It's on the YouTube channel. You can find it, watch it, listen to it. And as we heard about covenants last week, we're here now hearing about this and reminding ourselves about the new covenant that we live under. This is the new covenant, the blood of Jesus. This is the new covenant that covers all, everyone, The old covenant has served its purpose. Now we're under the new covenant. Hebrews 8 verse 6 says, 
But in fact, the ministry Jesus has received as is superior to theirs, as the covenant of which he is mediator, is superior to the old one. Since the new covenant is established on better promises. And also Hebrews 9 verse 15 says, For this reason Christ is the mediator of a new covenant, that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance. Now that he has died as a ransom, to set them free from the sins committed under the first covenant. Jesus has done his part. He's died, he's given his blood, he's had his body broken. Now it's our turn. It's our part. So today, let us remember the importance of communion. And let us give it its deserved decorum. The importance of what this table represents and what the things on it represent cannot be understated and cannot be underestimated in their power. It's something that I had to learn. It's something that we all have had to learn. And it's something that we all will be reminded of time and time again. But let us not let those reminders wear down the importance. Let us not let those reminders wear down the significance that this table has. Let us always come to the communion table with the right approach. The approach of a reflective heart. A reflective heart that is ready to confess. That is ready to be honest and truthful with God. A heart that is ready to receive from God. As we come to the table in a moment, let us come having examined ourselves. If you do not examine yourself, don't come to the table. Let us do this in remembrance of the sacrifice of Jesus, whose body was broken and hung on a cross, whose blood was spilled, not for what he had done, but to cover us. So that we might be brought back to the Father. to walk in the new covenant, to walk with that promise of eternal life. Cleansed by the blood of the Lamb. Just like it was painted over those doorways, the lives that were spared because they listened to the instruction of God. This blood the blood of Jesus, if we listen to the instruction of God, we listen to the instruction of Jesus and remember with the reverence that it's deserved, with the confession that we need, with the honesty with God, the blood of the Lamb covers all our sin. We just need to come to him in faith. So as I close, we're going to pray again. We're going to pray again for ourselves, and we're going to have a moment of reflection. Just have a few moments of silence as we reflect, and then I'll pray. Father God, we give you thanks for this day. We give you thanks, Father, for your word. And we give you thanks, Father, that you remind us, Lord God, of your word. And we thank you, Lord God, for your mercy. 
We thank you, Lord God, for your generosity. We thank you, Lord God, for your love. And we ask, Father God, that you forgive us when we have not taken as seriously as we should have coming to the communion table. Forgive us, Lord God, when we have not reflected, when we have not been honest with you, when we have tried to hide things from you. It was a foolish endeavour because you see all and you know all. And so we may as well be honest with you. We will be all the better for it. Help us, Lord God, to be honest with you today. Help us, Lord God, to be honest with you tomorrow. Help us, Lord God, to be honest with you each and every day. That we do not walk in disobedience, that we do not walk against you, that we do not walk in sin. We thank you, Lord God, once again for the mercy that you have shown us, for the love that you have shown us through giving us your Son as the sacrificial lamb. We pray, Lord God, that as we worship, we will continue to reflect, we will continue to be honest with you. Help us, Lord God, to worship you in spirit and in truth. Help us, Lord God, to not take for granted the blood of the Lamb. Amen.